Dan Mullen, what happened? Welcome to the Voice of College Football. Best discussion, debate, and analysis right here. Lock it in. Once you've subscribed, hit that bell for the notifications to know when we go live, which is just about every day. Live streams all over the place, team channels, 25 of them, and call-in shows throughout the week. All right, let's check out Dan Mullen's last year at Florida. He's always been quirky, strange, not necessarily my first choice to run an elite college football program, but successful. No doubt about that as Florida offensive coordinator under Urban Meyer. He's got the national championship rings to prove it. And then on to Mississippi State as head coach. Successful there, especially considering the challenges in Starkville against the SEC Western Division. All right. He gets the job at Florida. Most of us, including me, consider that to be not only a good hire, but a good fit. He knows the landscape. Took over a Florida program that went 4-7 in 2017, so he immediately improved the production and the results on the field. But at the same time, the Gators weren't as bad as 4-7. and seven. Uh, That was a team that won the SEC Eastern Division in 2015 and 16, albeit a weaker SEC Eastern Division and had recruiting classes under Jim McElwain of numbers 9, 21, 11, and 12. So low teens in recruiting uh, the roster that Dan Mullen inherited. Okay, he takes over in 2018. Instantly, they're not only competitive, but they're top 10 good. They go 10 and 3. They were only down by a score to Georgia, entering the fourth quarter, a Georgia team that, of course, had gone to the national championship game and played Bama to the wire in the SEC title game that year. But they lost to Florida, they lost to Georgia, and took out Michigan in the Peach Bowl to finish in the top 10 in the nation at 10-3. and Then the next year, they improve even more. They play Georgia closer within one score for the entirety of the game, 24-17. They go 11-2, and finish in the top 10 again, and win the Orange Bowl. Then in 2020, a very odd, strange season. So if you would have told me, Prior to 2020, Dan Mullen is going to beat Georgia, win the SEC Eastern Division, and in a season in which Alabama proved to clearly be the best team in college football, would at least on the scoreboard give Bama its biggest challenge. I would say check, 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 great season for Dan Mullen. So he accomplished all that. Great. Beat Georgia, won the East, played confidently against Alabama when the tide was running through just about everybody else, including Ohio State and Texas A&M. But the bad of 2020 really weighed down the accomplishments. First of all, the excuses made after the Texas A&M loss. Crowd noise, 22,000 people. COVID restrictions, 22,000 people where there would normally be the ridiculous display at Kyle Field of 100,000-plus roaring fans, 22,000, and he blamed the loss on crowd noise. Then came the spectacle at the end of the first half of the Missouri game at home in the swamp when he ran out to midfield and instigated more fighting and brawling between the teams and was reprimanded and fined by the SEC. Then he shows up at his news conference dressed like Darth Vader, which I would think to be harmless to a certain extent. I don't care about that. I think it's a little buffoonery. Don't want that out of my head coach. But on top of it, it again with Dan Mullen is awareness, not understanding that this is coming off the heels of what happened against Mizzou. So let's be taken seriously at this point. Then came the end of the season. They had a chance to, to get to the college football playoff, and then came the shoe and the throw against LSU. Well, on one hand, you could say that the players are the reflection of the head coach, and you could never imagine a Nick Saban coached player doing anything that stupid, that careless, that dumb, especially in that situation. So on one hand, yes, Dan Mullen's responsible. He cannot control the actions of every single athlete in the program at all times. But once it was done and they lost the game to LSU, he dismissed it. He didn't see it. I didn't really see it. I'm going to have to look into it. He did not take accountability for the action. And then this would prove to be a trend. The most alarming, for me, the most alarming action by Dan Mullen 
in regards to representing the program was Florida's approach to the Cotton Bowl. Okay, he lost Kyle Pitts, Kadarius Tony, and a number of key players for the Cotton Bowl. But he completely dismissed himself from the team. Said that this wasn't the Florida team of 2020. We have played our last game. This is not our team. It's not your team. You were the head coach. You recruited the players or inherited those players in the locker room. They report to you. They're supposed to be your family. And you're detaching from them. You're distancing yourself from your own players. I don't care if they're walk-ons, who they are. They are yours. They wear the Florida uniform. They're your players. And you're going to diss them? You're going to throw them to the curb. And that's what Dan Mullen did. All you have to do is look and see how Mac Brown handled a similar situation with North Carolina against Texas A&M in the Orange Bowl. He lost his two best running backs, two tremendous players who are now making an impact in the NFL, lost his two best wide receivers, lost his best defensive player, didn't make excuses, held his head up, prepared his team, got them ready. They went down and played in the Orange Bowl, and sure, they lost, but Mac Brown was actually given credit for preparing a team that was outmanned and taking Texas A&M to a one-score game with one minute left in the game. They played well. They played hard. They showed up. They accounted for themselves. And that's the kind of program Mac Brown's built versus the program Dan Mullins built, which was a complete embarrassment to the Cotton Bowl and to college football and to Florida football. Then in 2021, he cannot decide on a quarterback. Sure, there's nothing wrong with playing. If, if you cannot get a complete look and feel in August camp and you want to see the bullets fly and how they'll respond against game competition, sure. But he didn't make a decision and continues to play both quarterbacks in a non-effective way. And that's what's supposed to be his calling card. The rush defense against LSU was atrocious. LSU, check the records, check the stats. LSU cannot run the ball against anybody except Florida. <laughs> Ty Davis Price ran for 287 yards against Florida, and LSU can't run the ball against anybody else. 287 yards, 49 points on the board for an LSU program that looked weak and like it was giving up on the season at the point, at that point. And I should have mentioned going into the 2021 season, why did he not fire Todd Grantham? That seemed to be the consensus among people that know Florida football and know the ins and outs of that defense. They were 74th in the nation in scoring defense, number 86 in total defense. And beyond the numbers, all you had to do was watch the play versus what they had recruited and developed or tried to develop it was just substandard Florida football on the defensive side of the ball, especially considering what we had seen under Will Muschamp and Jim McElwain. A complete upgrade on the offensive side, downgrade on the defensive side. Well, trading offense for defense or defense for offense is not going to get it done against Georgia and the rest of the SEC. Then came the Georgia game. They fought, they competed for a half, they imploded at the end of the first half. Bottom line, they did not compete against Georgia, and nobody really has. I understand that. But Clemson, for sure, but also within the division and within the conference, Auburn, Tennessee, and Kentucky all played Georgia much tougher than Florida. Florida is supposed to be the main rival and the chief nemesis of Georgia and the one team capable of contending against them. Not the case. Again, Tennessee, Auburn, Kentucky all competed much better than Florida did against Georgia. And then came South Carolina. We are still looking for Josh Van in the end zone if we play defensive back for Florida. There are videos made out there that are hilarious about what South Carolina wide receiver Josh Van could be doing during the time that the Florida defense was trying to find him in the end zone.
painting pictures, organizing his wardrobe, doing all sorts of things that he could do in the end zone. Check it out. It's hilarious. I don't know where to find it, but it is hilarious because that is such a depiction in one play of the Florida defense and what's happened here. South Carolina beat Vandy by one point. They ripped Florida by 23 points. It was not an upset at the end of the game. They blew them out. They dominated. South Carolina beats Florida 40 to 17. And then this Stanford, excuse me, Stanford showing 42 points in the first half. Florida finally wins. They come back. They avoid complete embarrassment by running up 717 yards of total offense. So the offense showed up, but they were not playing a top-notch FCS opponent. Sanford was 4-5 and five entering the game, and they gave up 42 points, 52 for the total game, and that's a record against an SEC opponent. And, oh, yeah, what about recruiting? Mention recruiting to Dan Mullen, and he doesn't want to talk about it. Mention it to Kirby Smart, and he says, that's the lifeblood of the program. You have to recruit. We have a great defense because we've got great players. Dan Mullen says, well, we'll recruit. And I understand Dan Mullen and a Florida staff to have a top 10 to 15 class in the nation, which he's generally done. You have to be recruiting all the time. So it's not as though that there isn't some level of effort there but you have to be dedicated to recruiting and you've got to talk recruiting. And when asked that the Florida fan base does not want to hear that. Uh, we're not thinking about recruiting. We're not talking about that right now. We'll deal with that in the off season. We're playing football right now. No, the Florida fan base wants to hear. Yes, we are dedicated to recruiting. Recruiting is important. Recruiting is everything. And we are building relationships. We are doing everything we can to build the best 2022 recruiting class at Florida that we can possibly, possibly build. That's what the Florida fan base needs to hear. My thoughts on Florida football and uh, Dan Mullen needs to go at this point. I don't think there's any question about that. It is gone beyond the point of return in my estimation. Your comments below right here at the Voice of College Football. And we will see you next time.